Do you have a hope that will last for eternity? The Bible offers you one. That's next on The Prophetic Connection. This place among the Molos, very near. Fulfilling the prophecy, waiting for the day when the Messiah will come. As we begin this new series of The Prophetic Connection, we're focusing on the letters of Peter and John, two of Jesus' apostles. My backdrop for this morning is the beautiful modern city of Tel Aviv, and of course the coastline of Israel at the Mediterranean. Tel Aviv is spoken of as a hedonistic city. and Why not? It's on the ocean. It's a playground for uh, actually for the rich and the poor because the beach is available to everybody. A beautiful setting on the Mediterranean. It's a good place to ask that question, do you have a hope that will last for eternity? Because if we live for this world only, we are very poor people. Listen to the words of uh, Peter in 1 Peter, in the very first chapter in verse 4 speaking about an eternal inheritance, that those who believe in Christ are born to an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So what kind of inheritance are we building for the future? Not for retirement, but for eternity. Yes, we can enjoy the pleasures of this life. We can enjoy the beach, the Mediterranean Sea, you hear the birds singing in the early morning, and it's very early morning here in Israel. Those are all good things. But eternity is forever, and we need to be thinking about that and what kind of an inheritance we will have there in God's eternity. More about this in this first episode of this new series of The Prophetic Connection. Peter the eager disciple of Jesus, known for his impulsive yet often inspiring behavior is a favorite among many believers. But what do we really know about this disciple and early church father? Peter was one of Jesus' special dis disciples, one of the three, Peter, James, and John. He came from a little town called Bethsaida, just north of the Sea of Galilee, and he was a fisherman. So that town was very close to the water and uh, Peter was led to the Lord by his brother. His brother was Andrew. Andrew met Jesus long before Jesus met Peter. John the Baptist was preaching down by the Jordan River and when Jesus came, he said, behold, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Andrew heard that and then he went and told his brother Peter, Simon Peter, I've met the Messiah. Well, the apostle Peter was originally called Simon and he was, um, according to Matthew, the first of the apostles that was called. He and his brother Andrew were fishermen uh, somewhere near Capernaum. And uh, the Lord showed up and spoke to them both and said, follow me. They dropped their nets and uh, nothing was ever the same in their lives again um, in Peter's life. Of course, his name was changed to Peter. And uh, that's a remarkable story later on. I like to think of Peter as a man of the earth, someone who was real and he was raw. He a lot of times didn't even filter his own questions and answers and opinions to Yeshua. So I can relate with him in a lot of ways, but I think he was a common man uh, that the Lord called to a very high calling, probably even higher than Peter thought of himself. Did Peter have a close or special relationship with Jesus? Well, the apostle Peter was an eyewitness and one of the closest associates of the Lord. Uh, when you think this man woke up every morning for more than three years and looked at the face of God incarnate, he knew minute details about the life of Jesus. He knew the emotions of Jesus. He knew the looks on his face. He knew the tone of his voice. And he heard all the teachings, not just the few we have in the New Testament, all the teachings. This man, whatever his background was, by the time he was finished with the Lord, or the Lord is finished with him, he was a spiritual giant. 
Do Peter's letters have any relevance for today? The writings of Peter I find very rich. I, I think they are very uh, earthy because they have relevance. They, they give instruction. They have a prophetic edge also, I think, because back in the time of the writings, he would have had to think to himself futuristically what his instructions would mean to the future body of Messiah. We look at them today as, as very foundational and fundamental because they do give very specific instructions on how to run a congregation, how to build relationships, how to restore relationships when broken. And so for that reason, I think they are relevant, they are rich, they have a prophetic edge to them, and they're very applicable today. Peter, who walked and talked with Jesus, uh, knew him for three years at least, writes now in the letter having had some distance from that time and is still, his faith is strong and his faith is really the kind of faith that was tested in the fire, uh, in persecution. We hear that Peter ultimately was crucified upside down. Uh, he didn't feel he was worthy to be crucified the way Jesus was, so he voluntarily was crucified upside down. And then he talks in his letter about the fiery uh, persecution that we go through that should not be a surprise, he says. We ought to expect it. If we, if we really believe in Jesus and we follow him and just the way he was rejected by so many, we'll be rejected as well. We'll be persecuted. And that's relevant for today. There is no century in history where more Christians have been persecuted than our century. Since the Bible contains numerous prophetic warnings about the future persecution of Christians, does it also address the many other challenges Christians may have to face in each and all generations precisely because of their faith in Jesus of Nazareth? This life that we live on this strange planet can be very confusing at times, changing cultures, changing governments. We need a stake in the ground. We need something that doesn't move. And the Bible provides that for us as believers. It provides a roadmap, if you will. Uh, the Lord has mapped out for us what the future will look like. If we'll just read it, we'll be able to confidently follow through with what the Lord said He would do and how He said He would walk with us through this life. So for me, the Bible is important because I don't know that I would know how to live this life if I didn't have the instructions of the Lord. The Bible is important because it's God's inspired Word. And in it is what we know for sure about God and His eternal plan. And when we understand the Bible correctly, we begin to peer into eternal plans that God has made before the foundation of the world. God is faithful to His plans. He's working His plans. He will accomplish His plans. And the Bible is our window into that. Simon called Peter truly did keep company with the Christ. He learned many things from him, including spiritual principles Peter remembered, recorded, and passed on to succeeding generations of Christians. Don't go away. After this short break, Dr. John Tweedy returns with his teaching. As we begin this new series on the letters of Peter and John, and in fact, where John's concerned, we can also look at the fourth gospel, which he wrote, as well as the book of Revelation, uh, the panorama of the future that the risen Christ revealed to John. But our primary focus uh, will be the letters of Peter and John. My backdrop for this first teaching session is St. Peter's Church in Jaffa, or Joppa, on the coast of Israel, just south of the modern city of Tel Aviv. And this church commemorates a miracle that occurred in Jaffa. It seems that a Christian woman named Tabitha, that was her Aramaic name, but another name is used as well in the New Testament in Acts chapter 9. She was also known as Dor Dorcas, which is the Greek version of Tabitha. But she was highly respected in this community and she fell ill and of course uh, subsequently died. But Peter wasn't far from here at a place called Lod. Actually that's the modern the location for the modern airport, the Ben-Gurion Airport. So the Christian disciples in Joppa, Joppa, Joppa here sent there and Peter came. And he raised this lady from the dead. You can imagine the stir that that caused here. So now the disciples of Jesus were doing the very miracles they had seen 
Jesus do? Well, why study the letters of Peter and John that we find in the New Testament? Let me give you some basic reasons. Uh, first of all, they were among the first, the primary 12 disciples that Jesus actually chose. Um, and actually, uh, Peter, James, and John were part of the inner circle. And James and John, of course, were brothers. But oftentimes, Jesus would take those three with him and show them things the others uh, weren't allowed to see. And a great example of that is found in uh, Mark's Gospel in chapter 9. And it's actually the story of the Mount of Transfiguration experience. And let me just give you the context for that in Mark 9, beginning in verse 1. And he, Jesus, said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. So notice that Peter and John, uh, that's the focus for this new series of the prophetic connection. They were there, and James was with them, and led them up onto a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. I won't take time to read the rest of the verses, but I will give you the context of that. And what happened was that two Old Testament figures, Moses and Elijah, Moses presumably representing the prophets, uh, or the law rather, and Elijah representing the prophets, appeared to Jesus. Now these two men, in, in Elijah's case, he was taken up to heaven in a, a whirlwind, and of course in a fiery chariot. Whereas um, Moses, we're told in Deuteronomy in chapter 34, died and God buried him somewhere over in what today is the kingdom of Jordan. But these two men are, for hundreds of years, have not been on the earth. And all of a sudden they appear on this mountain in Galilee. The mountain isn't named, but this is the experience that these three disciples have that the others did not. So they were allowed to see things the other disciples didn't see and experience things the other disciples didn't experience. So that's the first thing. The second thing is they heard his teachings and saw his miracles. They were eyewitnesses to the things that Jesus said and the things that he did. The third thing I would say is that more than 30 years have passed since the crucifixion, the resurrection, Jesus' ascension into heaven. So these have been 30 years of being apostles, disciples, of doing the miracles that Jesus did and of carrying his word. Peter and John have experienced a lot by this time. They've experienced the ups and downs of life. Uh, in fact, John lost his brother James when King Herod had him killed and put to the sword. So there are, there are struggles in their lives. There is grief. And all this time, they've been walking with Christ, being led by the Holy Spirit. So when 30 years have passed since Jesus' ascension into heaven, they have much to say and they have much to teach the church then, now, and of course, down through the ages. So let's begin in the beginning in the first letter of Peter in chapter 1, where he says simply, by way of introduction, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the, the, the pilgrims of the dispersion. And when we speak of the dispersion in the Latin, it's diaspora, and that's the expulsion of the Jews, most of the Jews, out of the land of Israel. So he addresses them, and he mentions provinces that existed in his day in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Remember, these are the words of the man who denied knowing Jesus three times until he heard the cock crowing in the early morning. This is the Peter who uh, failed miserably, but was restored by Christ to the position of disciple and apostle. And the hardest lessons in life usually are the ones that uh, cause us the most pain because they shape us and mold us if we let them uh, and we become a better person because of them. And so life's often just putting one foot in front of the other uh, over the hurdles and around the difficult places and of course 
through the valley experiences of life as well. So Peter writes to this broad audience, but he might just as well have been writing his letter to us today in the 21st century. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a living hope because Christ lives in heaven. Verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You know, I'm amazed uh, when I see television and the number of uh, famous people, well, they're television, movies, or television or movie stars, uh, promoting gold and silver as if our lives depended upon it and telling us that we would be wise to do what they do. And of course, they're paid to say that, we know that, but to store it up uh, for the future. But gold and silver fade away. I've been married a very long time, and even though I have this gold band uh, that signifies my, my marriage, I noticed that on one side of it, it's, it's thinner than it was uh, when I first began to wear it. It's, it's fading away over time. And that's true for all things on the earth. They fade away over time. But Peter wants to draw the great contrast for the things of this world that fade away over time and the things in heaven that are incorruptible and do not fade away. And then he says of these things, uh, and speaking of, of actually his audience in verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, meaning at the end of days. And the Greek word here that he uses for kept is very much like a garrison. Uh, probably I could suggest the, the ring around the President of the United States, the Secret Service, those that are there, if necessary, to lay down their lives to protect the President. And so they swear an oath, I believe, to that effect. So that's the idea here. We are kept by this impenetrable ring around us, but this is the inheritance we have in heaven that is stored up for us. And then Peter shifts a gear, and he can do this because he, he knows from personal experience. Verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Peter knows what it is to live the Christian life because he's living it. And he knows that we go through trials of our faith, but that's to burn away the dross, the excess that isn't necessary anyway. And it's always about God shaping us in the furnace of life's afflictions. Then he says, because what remains, verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Sometimes in the hard places of life, it seems that God is far away from us. But Peter is saying it's, that's never the case. But sometimes God lets us burn in the furnace of affliction. But it's always for a greater purpose than we can see and really understand in this life. And then he says in verse 8, Whom, having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, and full of glory. And that kind of joy you can only have if you believe in the kingdom of heaven to come. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And then he says this intriguing thing. He said, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified before the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. What is Peter really saying here? He's saying the prophets saw the future. They prophesied of a Messiah figure to come, but they didn't leave, live to see his coming. But they looked into it and they wondered about it and um, in fact looked toward it. But, and of course they couldn't because Christ hadn't come. But now that he has come, you who believe and, uh, and believe in him, you're seeing the very thing. You have the very reality of the coming of Christ because you believe in him. And even the prophets, though they were great men and women of God, didn't live to see the reality of the coming of God's Messiah. 
And then he says in verse 12, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So then we continue what it is to live as a Christian before God our Father. Verse 13, therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'll jump to verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but, and here's the contrast, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and give him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. After this short break, I'll share something that Christians have that people who do not believe do not have. So what is it that Christians have that others do not? Well, obviously they have a faith in Jesus of Nazareth and all that he accomplished on the cross at Jerusalem. But in the context of this teaching, based upon 1 Peter chapter 1, it's what Peter says at the end of the chapter, beginning in verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And I believe that in this context, that's what we have, Christians have that others do not. It's this, um, a, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. I'm wondering if Peter remembered um, what Jesus said to the disciples recorded in Luke's gospel in chapter 21 in verse 33. He said this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So what we as Christians have that others do not is faith in the enduring and the abiding word of Almighty God. That's why when we present, when we present the prophetic connection based upon the word of God, we do it with incredible confidence that this is the word of God for all generations. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Meaning it is the enduring truth that God has given us through his prophets, apostles, and of course, the Lord himself. And then Peter wraps it up this way. He says in verse 24, drawing once again a contrast between temporal things and eternal things. Temporal things pass away in time. Eternal things are eternal. So he says, because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. That's a sobering thought that the wealth of the world, we speak in our generation of billionaires who can't even uh, comprehend how wealthy they are. But in the moment of their death, all of that wealth goes to others and it's lost forever where they are concerned. But eternity, our inheritance fades not away and it's reserved, kept in heaven for us. And that's our inheritance in Jesus of Nazareth. I remember hearing a British movie star say, what is fame? He said, it isn't that you know more people, it's just that more people know you. And that was a wise saying he realized, even though he was a famous movie star, what does it really mean? I don't have any more friends than I had before and perhaps maybe even less. It just means, fame just means more people know you. 
But the most important thing is, is our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The book that records the names of those who are born again of the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus of Nazareth. The next episode, why Christians are called out of the darkest places of this world and of this life. Thanks for watching the Prophetic Connection. Join us next week for Called Out of Darkness.